panel. Oh, great. Who could explain what it is? <laughs> Who it applies to? What it does? Well, in simple terms, the General Data Protection Regulation was designed to harmonize data privacy laws across Europe, protect and empower all EU citizens' data privacy, and reshape the way organizations across the region approach data privacy. The EU Parliament approved the GDPR on April 14, 2016, and it will begin being enforced on May 25th of this year, at which time organizations in noncompliance may face heavy fines. Essentially, the GDPR creates a global privacy regime. Thankfully, we have a panel of experts here who will be able to break all of this down for us. First, we have Kelly DeMarcus Beside, a partner at Venable, and she's in the e-commerce privacy and cybersecurity group, where she advises and represents clients on issues related to privacy and e-commerce. Kelly's practice concentrates on US and global personal data privacy and security. Next to Kelly, we have Joe Jerome. Joe Jerome is with the Center for Democracy and Technology, and he's policy counsel there on the Privacy and Data Project. Joe's work focuses on the legal and ethical questions posed by smart technologies and big data. Next to Joe. Sorry about that. We have Amrick DuPont, and he's a counselor um, for the Justice and Home Affairs at the Delegation of the European Union in the United States. The delegation represents the EU and the US and works in close coordination with the embassies and consulates of the 28 EU member states. And last but not least, we have Mike Godwin. Mike is a distinguished senior fellow with the R Street Institute, focused on the areas of patent and copyright reform, surveillance reform, technology policy, freedom of expression, and global internet policy. So let's start by laying the foundation here. Uh, we keep hearing that the GDPR will affect everyone. All companies will have to comply in some way. Um, and it even applies to aliens, according to Professor Dan Solov's cartoon on the GDPR scope, if any of you all have seen that. So I'd like to open it up to the panel. Who does the GDPR really affect? Where's it going? Well, thank you, thank you, Melanie, and thanks to the Congressional Internet Caucus um, Academy for your invitation today. It's, I think it's a really great and timely opportunity to, to speak about the GDPR. Um, if I, I mean, three takeaways, I mean, if you want to think, think what, who the GDPR applies to, uh, you need to understand first what it does, uh, and, and how it does it, if you want to understand to whom it applies. Uh, I think, I mean, the main takeaway on what the GDPR does is really to set a baseline, and a, a very high one, on the protection of personal data uh, in, in Europe uh, for European data subjects. Uh, what we have here is an overarching legislation, uh, which is not covering sectoral fields that like, like you are familiar with in the US, uh, but co covering everything, um, with the same set of principles that you find ac actually across the world. It gives uh, a certain set of rights to data subjects, uh, rights to, I mean, it gives them back the control over the data, uh, right to access to rectify the data, right to portability of their data, right to their data, and also sets a clear baseline on what consent means. How it does it, I think this is also key in, in this context. Um, you mentioned regulation. I mean, regulation in EU legalese uh, means something. Uh, it means a single rule across the continent. Uh, we see it as, re as a, actually a big bonus for businesses. In the past, if you were an American company based in Poland, uh, wanting to expand your business to Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, you would have to learn about the privacy laws of Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia. Uh, it's no longer the case. This, the GDPR will replace uh, 28 legislations and apply uh, across the continent. It's what, I mean, for us, it's an element of what we call the digital single market, so same rules uh, across Europe. And, and where it applies, and I think, I mean, the, I like the cartoon of Professor Solov uh, very much, um, of course, I mean, the focus of our regulation is European data subjects. We don't make a distinction between citizens, non-citizens, residents. Actually, if you get the chance to travel on a staff deal to Europe, uh, you will be covered by the GDPR, so you can even test it. Um, but what the other side of the coin is that if you provide services or if you want to sell goods to European citizens, if you monitor the behavior of European, city, uh, of European data subjects, citizens, 
uh, then you also have to apply the principles uh, of GDPR. Uh, of the GDPR, and this is exactly when this issue of compliance uh, come into play for American companies or for any company in the world. I mean, it's not only. Uh, I mean, we know that uh, American companies, because of the share of um, transatlantic digital trade, have, uh, are, I mean, are very important in that context, but. Similarly, I mean, the rules will apply to any Japanese or Chinese company or Indian company doing business in Europe. Um, the good thing is that for some of them, they have legislation which is actually closer to what we have in Europe. Okay, great. That was a great overview and an excellent background. Um, Joe or Kelly, can you explain what exactly a data subject is and what rights they have? Team on okay. this. Okay. Um, so data subjects are you and me, um, individuals, anybody who you know, is producing personal information about themselves. Um, they are a data subject under EU law. Um, I, I guess what I, to sort of pivot on that question a little bit, um, why the GDPR matters to US policymakers is I think it basically is a law that touches anybody that is, t is collecting data. Um, and so anybody that's collecting data is probably having some intersection with individuals and hence have, result, have to impact these data subjects. Um, and so I think we can, the GDPR has lots of really confusing legal provisions and applications, and I think we have to think about the GDPR in terms of both as a law, you know, when a data protection authority is going to come knocking on a company's door, um, or the practical implications of this law. And the practical implications are such that basically anyone that's touching data um, has to be thinking about the general data protection regulation. Um, and so data subjects are individuals, and I think in the United States, we tend to think of, of data as a sort of currency, uh, as something that's really valuable to companies. Um, the, the expression tends to be that data is the new oil. Uh, the GDPR sort of flips it on its head and says, no, data is something that is produced by individuals, individual data subjects, and these data subjects have rights um, to this data, and, and companies have a responsibility and a duty um, to use information responsibly. And it's, you know, and this is the entire process of data collection. So collecting information, using information, sharing information. Um, and the GDPR offers a whole host of, of rights to individuals. Um, some of these are actually built in existing European data protection law. Um, so the example I always like to give is, is the right to data access. Um, if you are a company and you're collecting information and it is personal data, a data subject has a right to access that information. Um, this isn't new, but the GDPR sort of kicks it up a notch through its you know, penalties and other provisions. And so these are, these are things that, that individual activists and individual citizens have already taken advantage of. The really good example of this is, is Max Schrems, who a couple of years ago went to Facebook and using his access rights said, give me all the data you've got on me. And Facebook challenged this, and ultimately, um, Facebook had to produce tools, data export tools, and a full file of information about Max Schrems. Um, more recently, we've seen journalists sort of go to Tinder and ask for, hey, Tinder, give me all the information you have on me. And Tinder produces a giant 800-page PDF of all the people you swiped left and right on. Um, under the GDPR, the GDPR just sort of, I think, augments these rights. Um, so in, instead of having a, a PDF under the GDPR, there's a, a right to data portability. So now the data subject not only should be able to expect a PDF, which isn't terribly useful to them, but they should be able to expect a machine-readable file and be able to take that information elsewhere or otherwise gain insights. Um, and so data subjects have a whole lot of other rights. Um, I think Mike will probably talk about the right to be forgotten. Um, but the, the data subject rights are basically the way that it inverts the GDPR from being a compliance regime to a, a rights-based regime because I think the rest of us will sort of talk about the provisions of the GDPR that companies have to do to comply with it. And so that's a lot of paperwork and a lot of other sort of just bureaucratic red tape sometimes. Um, but the data subject rights are the things that really give the GDPR teeth and so just to expand on that, because I, I'm, I represent the perspective of U.S. companies and organizations who are working towards GDPR readiness on that May 25th timeline, I think Joe's given you a good sense of some of these specific rights, but operationalizing these are, are proving to be a real challenge for U.S. companies. I think just to be clear, it does apply to a U.S. company or organization who has no offices or employees in the EU, but is fully 
uh, in the U.S., but reaching cross-border to offer their goods or services in the European market. And that's brought in, um, brought compliance burns on a whole host of U.S. companies and organizations. I'm talking, you know, every day to NGOs who are concerned about fundraising. Anybody that has a website on the internet at least has to go through the process of analyzing whether they are offering goods or services or the other prong is monitoring the behavior of EU data subjects on the internet. So um, anybody with a, a web presence really is struggling with how it applies to them. Um, the rights are you know, fundamental to the regulation and sort of, I think, of the heart and soul of the regulation, but how to apply them is not made very clear. So they're provided at, at a high level. An individual has a right to access his or her, her personal data. Okay, fine, but think about even a, a smaller mid-sized company. They have dozens of vendors, web hosting providers, cloud service providers. The data isn't in a file cabinet where they open a drawer, pull out the folder with that individual's name, and you know can present them with a, a copy of that data. Um, in addition, the concept of a data subject is not just data that's tied to an identified person, but also to an identifiable person, and that includes identification by an online identifier like an IP address. So U.S. companies who have long taken the position that the data they hold is anonymous or de-identified because it's only tied to an IP or an advertising identifier, they now have to catalog that data and be prepared to um, provide it or you know, exercise these other individual rights upon request. Great. Uh, Mike, I'll turn to you next. Do you want to expand upon the rights of erasure under the GDPR? Sure. Uh, a lot of you have heard about the right to be forgotten, uh, which uh, came up under the, the previous uh, uh, EU uh, uh, directive about, about personal information. Uh, and, and, and a case was decided uh, a few years ago, just a few years ago, in the European Court of Justice, in which a person who was mentioned in a newspaper article uh, was able to uh, uh, enforce his, what we, we call, for lack of a better term, right to be forgotten, Again, and, and the interesting thing to me, and I, it, it, it bears remembering, is that we often talk about the, these issues as if we were only talking about privacy in the sense of stuff that we have done that is non-private. Uh, and, and so we think about, you know, love letters or things that you've said to people, and, and we think in terms of uh, uh, kind of a personal autonomy space that happens inside your house, you know, that people don't normally have access to. But actually, the, the, the privacy, uh, the, uh, the GDPR, the General Data Privacy Regulation, addresses non-private information as well. It's really important to recognize this because you can engage in transactions that are non-private. You can certainly be uh, subject of news stories, subject uh, uh, to research. You can be a public figure, and you still have these rights. So in some sense, it's, it, it's a mistake, I think, to think of this in terms of pure privacy, when in fact, what, uh, as I read it, the GDPR uh, creates, or, or uh, I should say uh, enacts, pursuant to uh, European Union rights instruments, is a kind of a general property right and information about you, a general right and information about you, whether it's public or private. Uh, so in a previous case, uh, uh, in Google, uh, involving Google Spain initially and later, of uh, the larger Google, which is now Alphabet, uh, a person who was unhappy about an old 1990s news story uh, that was published about his about debt collection uh, sued and won uh, uh, recognition of what we later call the right to be forgotten. Well, the 1990s data protection regulation was created at a time when it was thought that the main collectors of, pri of individual data, of personal data, were like credit agencies and banks and maybe governments. It was not, there were very large institutions and there were few of them. What, what that regulation didn't anticipate is the rise of social media, the fact that we have a, you know, global cloud services in which a lot of people, a lot of entities, big and small, collect personal information. And so it's really important to recognize this, that the GDPR is uh, trying to establish and is establishing a right for you to control your data, which may be private and it may be public, uh, and it may be not as just as against data collection, and not just as against credit reporting agencies, but also against anyone who's ever collected transactional data. So if you are a startup company, for example, in the United States, 
and you think of yourself as a small startup company, you may still, because you offer services over the, over the international forum, that's the internet, you may still find yourself subject to uh, requirements of complying with GDP, GDPR, including things not just uh, the right to erasure, and I'll focus on that because you asked me about that, but maybe some other rights a, as well. And this is kind of an interesting change because in the United States and in some other common law countries and in uh, some other countries around the world, the presumption has been that if you got public, if information about you became public, then it was public. And you sort of couldn't, uh, uh, you know, put the lightning back in the bottle. You really couldn't capture uh, the, the escaped knowledge that was now uh, public. But the GDPR really does flip that presumption around. And, is, and uh, it does create the expectation that maybe someday, even if you were unhappy with something that was public about you 20 years ago, you may be able to pull that uh, information to have that information erased or you may be able to check and, 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 and pose other kinds of sanctions on any entity, large or small, including American entities, including entities that are outside the EU, uh, and require people to pull or change information. So that's going to be my overview. I guess I would just say, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Right. Um, we make the assumption, again, I think in the United States, that public means non-private, and I don't think that's accurate. Um, what the GDPR, I think, is trying to do is acknowledge the fact that the digital ecosystem in the digital world has made things like public and non-private mushier or harder to understand. Um, it, it's sort of giving people new rights of obscurity. Um, you know, back in the day, things, <laughs> you know, certainly everything was made public. Court records were always public. Divorces, bankruptcies were public, uh, but they weren't necessarily accessible. Um, and so as a result, tech companies, not just tech companies, companies have have sort of built giant business models off of this notion that information was public um, and they didn't put controls around it because yes, the information was public, but that didn't mean I think that, that people lost any expectation that they still have interest in that information. And so I think the GDPR is trying to acknowledge the fact that you know, sometimes the digital ecosystem opened a Pandora's box of the way information can be used that could actually be sort of hurtful and harmful to individuals. Right. Um, the GDPR uh, emphasizes um, expressed consent, either by a statement or a clear affirmative action. Um, so Kelly, uh, what are the challenges that global companies will face given the complexities of their business and the strong emphasis on expressed consent in areas that it may be hard to get? Uh, for example, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle -vehicle communications, um, ad tech also seems to be very, very challenging. Is this going to have an effect on particular business models? Oh, absolutely. I think any business model where you don't have a direct interaction with the individual or, or per, uh, perhaps a touch point where you could obtain that consent creates a problem. So you listed to their vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. Um, ad tech is really struggling with this um, because it does require express, informed, affirmative consent, and that consent has to be tracked and refreshed per periodically as well. So a notion that you've collected data at some point in time and it's lawfully permissioned, that's sort of a, a living notion now, and it, it requires um, some interaction with, with an individual. And, and, and you will always retain the right to retract right. the information, even if you consented to share your uh, personal information, you have the right to retract it. Um, artificial intelligence seems to be the biggest opportunity for progress, uh, whether again it's self-driving cars or coming up with new ways to find cures for diseases. Uh, the data protection law has a very uh, strict rule for data minimization, and AI depends on large amounts of data. How will the GDPR affect Europe's ability to compete? Emery, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, one of, one of the key points, I mean, in, in the GDPR is the idea to build a regulation which is fit for the future. So, I mean, in a way, I mean, I think the, what, I mean, I've, I've heard time and again, I mean, uh, concerns on uh, the GDPR stifling innovation. I think on, on, the, on the contrary, I mean, the GDPR can actually trigger innovation. Uh, I mean, you have the concepts of um, data prote protection by design and by default, for instance, which is promoted by the GDPR. Uh, so saying, let's build systems which actually um, will allow to minimize uh, the risk of uh, the personal data being, uh, let's say, out, out in the wild, but rather uh, systems where 
you, you ensure from the outset when you build your, your, your software, for instance, or the way you collect the information, that it's, it's going to be protected in, a, in the right way. You have the uh, emphasis on a pseudonymization, for instance, mm -hmm. um, on I mean, the possibility to use, uh, to use encryption. So, I mean, we, I think we are, we are thinking in terms of, we, I mean, the last uh, directive that you have was in 1995, uh, and clearly, I mean, and, and you face the same uh, challenges in the US, uh, spend some time on the, on the uh, access to evidence, for instance, with the Stored Communication Act. I mean, you have legislation from 1986. So um, you need at some stage to, to update it. And I think here we are, we are build building something which should hopefully be technology neutral and allow us to, uh, to meet the challenges of, uh, of the future. And, uh, and, uh, and without facing hurdles, saying, oh, the GDPR is written in such a way that we cannot really address this problem. So, um, Thank you. Uh, Joe, uh, and then we can turn back yeah, to Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I just wanted to say that um, I was asked initially what, what the data subject rights are, and one of the interesting components of the GDPR is, is it's what people are calling a right to explanation. Um, so the GDPR has really interesting provisions on automated decision making um, and profiling. And, uh, you know, I think there's, again, work to be done to explain exactly what that entails, but at the end of the day, um, I think it's a net positive. It is A, going to require lawyers and other compliance people to get a little bit more technical. Um, we have these concerns here. Um, it, it's good for companies and compliance professionals to be asking how models are being trained, where data is coming from that's informing algorithms. Um, companies need to be asking themselves how they plan to deploy different types of models. Um, and asking these questions are part and parcel with being able to, A, understand internally what you're doing, and then educating users, which again is the whole point of the GDPR. And I, I just wanna say for people in this room and for American audiences, this is stuff that we're already beginning to ask for. Um, you know, at the, at the Center for Democracy and Technology, we've been working um, with the city of New York. The city of New York just passed a, um, a bill to sort of create an algorithmic accountability task force um, that's gonna be charged with basically developing this type of expertise internally. Uh, and so I think the GDPR, by making this, you know, backed by law, is really, I think, going to help companies be more compliant and more thoughtful when they deploy artificial intelligence. So, so let me just add to this. I, one of the things that, that we're, we're, uh, you should anticipate is that any, any entity that, quali that falls within the scope of this regulation, whether it's a, a data controller or a data processor, and I'm not going to sort that out for you in this, but, I, you know, I'm not going to sort that out for you in just this minute, but um, they, may ha they will ha have a need or may have a need to hire a data protection officer who is someone who not only knows uh, the rules for compliance, the legal requirements for compliance but with the GDR, but also who has to keep abreast of, of the actual technology and the choices that are made kind of at the algorithm level and where those algorithms come from. So, so if you are a, a person who's both a tech geek and a lawyer, you will find yourself uh, you know, you will find yourself highly employable under this regime. I mean, this is, this is uh, very positive if you, if you have that skill set, but as you may guess, not everyone has that skill set yet. So what are the penalties for non-compliance? Oh my goodness. Want me to take, that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, up to 4% of your worldwide turnover, which is worldwide revenue or 20 million euro, whichever is higher. And then there is a lower penalty threshold that is 2% or 10 million euro. Um, I, I see surprised faces. The draft actually started at 6%, so this is a bit of an improvement. There are some penalty factors in the regulation, um, mainly going to if you're cooperating with an investigation or, and such, but um, the penalties are really what has, has focused the attention of U.S. companies on this compliance exercise. Thanks. Um, so the EU Privacy Shield framework was designed by the U.S. Department of Commerce and the EU Commission uh, European Commission to provide companies on both sides of the Atlantic with the mechanism to comply with data protection requirements uh, when transferring personal data from the EU to the United States in support of transatlantic commerce. Um, how does the GDPR re relate to the EU privacy shield, EU US privacy shield? So, I mean, the GDPR um, sets a number of conditions for transfers of data outside of the EU. And what the privacy shield does, I mean, privacy shield is in essence what we call an adequacy decision. So, which recognize that certain companies which, which self-certify uh, with the Department of Commerce uh, meet the conditions and actually, I mean, under US uh, law have, are accountable uh, to meet the conditions to process data uh, which they collect in Europe uh, in, in the United States. 
so that's I mean that's that's a relationship. So the idea in the GDPR is that the level of protection travels with the data, and to to do that you have different uh, instruments. You have binding corporate rules, uh, intra companies. You have model contractual clauses, uh, or you have um, so which which would be the type of let's say typical type of contracts that you can enter into. Um, and, and you have also the adequacy decisions, which the EU has with, I think, 12 or 13 countries. Uh, and the US, in the context of privacy shield, so it's not a wide sort of full recognition, in the context of privacy shield, self-certified company, and I think we have almost 3,000 of them currently, uh, I, I will, I mean, are, are, let's say, are given the right to process European citizens' data under certain conditions. It's, you have a wide set of rules uh, which, which are applied. Privacy shield, I mean, you mentioned uh, Max Schrems. Uh, so is, is a privacy shield is an outcome of a successful uh, challenge in front of the European Court of Justice in, uh, in 2015, which uh, put an end to the safe harbor system, which was in, which was in place since uh, 2000, and which, uh, I say, which didn't really meet the challenges of, uh, of, of, of today. So, uh, I mean, we are. So, so let me add to this. Uh, the privacy shield, uh, which was, uh, I mean, pardon me, the, 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 the privacy safe harbor regime that predates the privacy shield re represented an agreement uh, between the EU and the, and the United States about how to handle data. And that was successfully challenged by Max Schrems in the European Court of Justice. And it was found to be in the, in the ECJ to be deficient. Uh, uh, but fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, the, uh, uh, you know, we have a new data regulation. We essentially have a revised, updated uh, GDPR that replaces the 94-95 uh, EU standards about personal data protection. And, uh, and pursuant to that, and we've been implementing, we've been going through this process of transitioning to the GDPR uh, over the course of uh, two or three years, uh, we've developed uh, uh, privacy shield standards, which are involve self-certification. And that's really important, so that if you are a company that knows that you are going to want to be compliant, you have to you you ha you have a mechanism in which you can internally check and see whether you meet the compliance criteria and then self certify as a company that can engage in handling of data of of, of EU data subjects. That's that's good. The, the the tricky part is that you know of course it is self certification. So it may well be the case that certainly if you if you falsely self certify you're in trouble. But the also, but the difficulty I think that is actually a much bigger difficulty, is that because uh, 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 this regulation is new and because the terms are, uh, are are terms that business businesses, especially American businesses, but even European businesses are unused to, uh, there's some ambiguity about what compliance means, and there's some, and, and there will be a, a lot of uh, friction as this gets worked out, and different tribunals make assessments about whether or, or and also data protection authorities make assessment about whether you're compliant. I just wanted to add to that. So Privacy Shield is a fascinating topic and probably worth an entirely other session because um, it raises really tough questions about national security and, and, and intelligence access to information. But the, the point I'd like to add about Privacy Shield is we all know that the United States does not have a baseline privacy law, but Privacy Shield in effect is getting us, or at least getting the thousands of American companies that have signed up for it some of the way there. Um, and it's sort of just jarring, right, that we, we've created this framework that creates a set of protections for European citizens. It's enforced by US regulators, the Department of Commerce and the Federal Trade Commission, um, but it's ultimately to protect the rights of European citizens. Um, so it's a really fascinating commercial data transfer framework um, that ultimately is, again, being enforced by American regulators to protect Europeans. Um, I feel like that's something that uh, policymakers on the Hill should sort of see as a as an impetus to do our own sort of privacy law here. So I think what's interesting about that is I look at it from the perspective of the companies and you know one of the alternatives of the model contractual clauses which are these this packet of paper that you have to you know execute one on one with everybody who touches your data um, and I see Privacy Shield as a helpful program that actually streamlines this compliance piece for for US companies. So Emma yeah, just I mean, if you, if you have to remember two words about privacy shield, I mean, we, we speak about essentially equivalent. So the idea is really to have uh, a level of protection to this data which is transferred and, and processed in the US, which is essentially equivalent to what happens in Europe. And this is really where the courts have been looked at in the Schrems case and will be looking at if there are further challenges uh, to the shield. 
uh, in terms of, for instance, redress rights. And the second uh, aspect I would like to stress is the fact that Privacy Shield is reviewed annually. So there was the first review last year in September. Commissioner Jourova, who is the Commissioner for Justice, will come in about 10 days to DC. She will speak with, with the administration about it. And there will be a second review in September. And this leaves some margin of uh, adjustment as well to the shield if, if need be. So we want something which is a kind of livable um, framework, not something which will be set in stone for 15 years and then. Right. Yeah, let me just add one other thing, and that's that, uh, uh, you know, Max Schrems, who won the case, uh, uh, finding, uh, you know, in the ECJ, finding the deficiencies in the safe harbor rules, uh, has essentially declared that the privacy shield is inadequate, and, his, and, and uh, he and other uh, activists have made known that their intention is to challenge uh, the privacy shield, uh, and so we may hear more cases from the uh, European Court of Justice regarding that. Right. So let's talk about legitimate interests. Um, they can be a basis for lawful processing of data. Can anyone give us examples of processing that could be necessary for the le legitimate interest of a data controller? Uh, sure, I, I, I can't. Okay, I, you can I, let I'm Kelly sorry. go and then we'll turn back I'm to sure, you. I, I, I'm sure we may, say, I'm, we may say the same thing. I mean, okay. <laughs> certain, certain companies that offer services have to engage in a, a, a processing internally of user data for things like security. Uh, and, and uh, you know, you want to make sure that someone's not engaging in fraud on your system or hacking your system. There are all sorts of reasons. You want to make sure that you don't have duplication of records. You have legitimate business-related purposes for processing data uh, that don't necessarily trigger all the uh, 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 compliance requirements. But having said that, the framework that we have, as I understand it, under the GDPR requires you to minimize the extent to which you, you do that. Uh, and so you, you will, ha I mean, to s the GDPR doesn't become irrelevant if you have a legitimate purpose. It just becomes maybe a possible, uh, it, it, it becomes something that it may be an exception to, but your DPO will have to determine that for you. Your, your data protection officer will help you figure out whether you're doing that right. Kelly? Yeah, so just to take a, a step back, we talked about consent and now legitimate interest. Every piece of data you process, and process could be collection, use, disclosure, has to be supported by a lawful basis. There are six choices in the regulation. Consent is one and sort of the default position. Legitimate interest is another. It has existed in European law, but it's getting a lot of interest because of how hard consent is. So legitimate interest is kind of um, the alternative that everyone is trying to read as broadly as possible. Um, I, you know, some, Mike mentioned some examples that are cited in the recitals, fraud prevention, network security, I think we're seeing um, companies rely on legitimate interest for things like processing data for HR purposes, um, certain kinds of you know limited research, internal research, product development, that kind of thing. Whether that is supported, you know, by a reading of the regulation remains to be seen because there's pretty limited guidance on this point. But uh, legitimate interest has been the focus of a lot of attention for this reason, um, and companies are you know doing their best Can with I it. Ask? So I actually think yeah. the legitimate interest is sometimes the right the, the privacy laws that are being enforced mm -hmm. in a case valve from the GDPR. But I, I guess my understanding if you're a company and you're relying on legitimate interest, you probably have to be doing more engagement documentation. Can I say a, a data protection authority shows up and says, how did you justify this? Yeah, right. So so legitimate interest actually requires um, they, they warned me not to get too in the weeds when you asked the question. <laughs> it requires a balancing test. So you have to state what your interest is, like we have a commercial interest or you know payroll processing, and then balance it against the risk to the rights and freedoms to the individual. That's the actual language. And you're supposed to document this somewhere. So yeah, that's a process that would be overseen by your internal privacy resource, your DPO. Um, but you are, like everything else in the GDPR, which focuses on accountability, supposed to create records that memorialize all of this process. So what companies are doing now are looking at every piece of data they collect, mapping it to consent. If consent is required, then fixing the consent mechanism to meet the standard of the GDPR, or is it legitimate interest, or one of the other lawful basis of processing, like legal obligation is another one. Um, and then memorializing all of this process. So it's a sense of, of how challenging a compliance exercise it is. And keep in mind it applies to data you already have. So if you can't map it to one of these bases of processing, you're supposed to get rid of it by May 25th. 
That's right, and, and it seems worth uh, worth pointing out that uh, I if your data subject has fundamental rights that are uh, in, uh, affected by your your legitimate purposes, or if your data subject is a child, you know, there's basically uh, you, you, it's a strong prohibitions or or else. Uh, uh, Typically, the fundamental rights issues, uh, and this is fundamental rights as defined by European Union rights instruments primarily. Uh, if you are, you know, it, when you do the balancing test, these interests, whether they're fundamental rights interests or the interests of a child, typically are trump cards. And you probably, even if you have a legitimate purpose, you're going to be very careful or maybe a little timid about doing the, uh, you know, doing, you, invoking your legitimate purposes uh, authority to process stuff. So not getting into the weeds, but um, we can't have this conversation without mentioning the e-privacy regulation. So what is that and how does it intersect with the GDPR? Uh, so so e-privacy is the thing that's coming and it's the thing that I think a lot of Americans, uh, companies and even privacy professionals on this side of the Atlantic aren't thinking about because it's still, the e-privacy regulation is still in the policy stage. Um, so again, like, uh, like the fact that the GDPR is a movement from a, a directive to a regulation, there's an e-privacy directive, and this is the thing that basically is the cookie law in Europe. So when you go to websites in Europe, you have to click yes to cookies. Um, but it, it governs, um, so this is hopefully not getting too much in the weeds. The GDPR protects the fundamental right to data protection under European law. You also have a right to confidentiality of communication. So this is the type of thing of you, almost you want to think about like wiretaps and people who are intercepting, you know, chats or phone calls. And so that is what this is supposed to cover. But it, it has been, and again, it's it's being debated by all the many different organs in Europe. So the, the Parliament had its say. Different, the members of the Commission are working on things. Um, it's a it's sort of a mess. Um, they want to sort of create this framework that is going to be, it's supposed to particularize part of the GDPR, um, but it's going to cover all sorts of data transmission. So, um, you know, not just, you know, cookies on websites, but machine to machine communications, Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is governed by the e privacy regulation. Um, and what makes the e privacy regulation really challenging is it doesn't even have, like the GDPR, these six bases for processing data. It is largely based on consent. Um, there are some small exceptions for, for, for security or needing to, to actually provide the service. But in general, you have to have consent before you can do basically anything that any collection of, of data from electronic communications. And the e-privacy regulation is also sort of confusing because it's not so much concerned with personal data, it's concerned with communications data, which involves terms like metadata and all sorts of other things that get really technical really really fast. Um, and so we're creating, they're creating this, this law that is in some respects supposed to augment the GDPR, um, but I think a lot of people on all sides see it as potentially conflicting or overlapping or really being in tension with what the GDPR does. Um, and, you know, ideally they had hoped to have this go into effect alongside the GDPR in 75 days, um, but now it looks like it's going to take a few more years. Um, but, you know, we've been discussing legitimate interests and whether that's applicable. There's no legitimate interests in the privacy regulation. Yeah, so if you're trying to comply with the GDPR and you're redesigning your web page and trying to get consent, you actually need the e-privacy regulation to tell you <laughs> what that consent, what format of consent is acceptable. So there is a gap. I mean, there's engineering happening now that e-privacy can come along and say, actually, what you did was unlawful. So. And the advertisers just last week, just yesterday, put out a, uh, a transparency and consent framework, um, but it's designed to work or it's applicable to the GDPR. They're pretty silent on e-privacy because they don't know what to do yet. So, you have something to add? I, I, I did have something to add, but I'll, I'll take it. Okay, <laughs> hey, Mark, So, what do you predict will happen on May twenty fifth? How will this whole transition unfold? What should we be ready for on that day? I, I think I mean one one of the good elements of the GDPR is that. Um, Companies uh, had two years to to com I mean to prepare and to to comply uh, and I mean there have been a lot of discussions between uh, the companies and the data protection authorities in member states. I mean the, the commission has organized lots of roundtables, but this has really trickled down to uh, I mean to, to to local level and to member state level. So I think there is a very high level of awareness uh, in Europe, and I'm I'm sure I mean from our conversation that there is a very high level of awareness about the GDPR in the US. So I don't I don't really expect uh, a big bang. I mean we'll I mean yes I mean some. I mean, you will see 
um, citizens, consumers uh, going to their DPAs and, I mean, testing it, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is where, I mean, this uh, the question of, of, of fines and uh, compliance will, will kick in. But, I mean, let's say, I, I think we are really getting close. I mean, member states, I mean, it's true that in certain areas, legislation still has to be, uh, still has to be adjusted. Uh, the Article 29 Working Party, which is a group of data protection authorities in Europe, which will become the, uh, the board, uh, European Data Protection Board, uh, has issued some guidance, uh, which is available online, uh, which is also open for comments uh, to, to businesses and to, I mean, to consumer groups, to, uh, to NGOs, uh, which clarifies uh, in more details, for instance, what's the role of a data protection officer, uh, how should the fines uh, work. I mean, our idea is really to avoid the fragmentation of the market. I mean, of the, of the digital single market, so not to have German DPAs applying certain rules and Portuguese DPAs ap applying others. Um, so, I mean, still an ongoing conversation on certain issues, but also a good set of baseline uh, of guidelines uh, which have been issued by, by the DPAs and also by the Commission for, for citizens, but also for SMEs and for organizations. So, so I, I want to add something that actually maybe brings it home a little bit, and that's that, you know, if you are a person like me who has uh, you know, a significant social media network, you know, on Twitter or on uh, Facebook, one of the things I would do is if I had interactions with EU data subjects and I thought they were important, I would save them to my, <laughs> I would save them to my home directory on my computer because there's no guarantee that somewhere down the road that that information will still be there in the cloud or, on, or, or hosted on the service. So if you really want to keep a record of stuff, you know how we already are in the habit of taking screenshots of important texts uh, you know, that we do on our, our phones. I, I, I think that if you have interactions, if you, you know, it's always possible, for example, that, uh, and, and a lot of this depends on how the GDPR is applied to different social media networks and social media services, and we're not entirely sure about the contours of that. But look, if stuff is important, you need to save it, and you need to save it on your own. You cannot assume that the larger service is going to have that stuff sitting in storage for you to consult at some later date. Joe or Kelly, do you have anything to add to that? Just any forecasts? Um, I think U.S. companies are worried that there's going to be a large enforcement action against one of them pretty quickly after May, just to, to show, you know, regulators to show that they're serious. Um, I think what's harder to gauge is how much awareness there are among EU data subjects. You know, for example, we've talked a lot about these access rights. A lot of companies are engineering solutions to them, but nobody knows if they're going to get you know, 50 requests on day one. Uh, do individuals know they have these rights and how, how much that's going to impact? Yeah, yeah. let me just add to that, that you will have entity, you will have businesses large and small who believe that they are making a good effort, a, a good faith effort in compliance who discover that, oops, it wasn't good enough. That, that is something that I think is on the horizon and I think it particularly faces American companies who are, are really, you know, have to come from a standing start to compliance to this, uh, a personal information regime, but it, it could affect anyone. So I, I don't, I do not think the sky will fall on May 25th. Um, I think we're going to have an adjustment period where, again, there's a lot of stuff, despite the fact this is a regulation that's supposed to create a law, there's still a lot of stuff in it that's just unknown. Um, you know, so, you know, there's, there's issues around children's consent with different ages. So you cross, so basically member states are allowed to have um, different ages of consent between the ages of 13 and 16. Well, so what does that mean when you cross from one EU member state to the other and suddenly the age of consent is changed? Um, that's a question that I don't think anybody really has a clear answer to. And I, I would hope that the, the DPAs aren't, you know, overly unfair. I think, I think Kelly's right that they're gonna try and, you know, stretch their muscles a little bit here. Um, but, you know, I guess I wanna build on Mike's point to say that I think it's a good thing. Um, I think there are companies that are trying to make good faith efforts to comply. I think there's also companies that have had a really laissez-faire attitude around data. Um, and, you know, we talk, we go and talk to companies and tech companies all the time, and it's it's really hard to get them to care about privacy. And I understand that you're a smart up, uh, a startup, uh, <laughs> a, a privacy lawyer is probably not your first hire. Um, but again, to go back to my my rambling initial answer. We're talking about people's personal data here, and we're, we're facing a universe where what personal data is, is is increasingly hard to define. And so I really want my companies to have at least people internally that serve as, as checks on really aggressive data use. Um, 
I, I think a laissez-faire attitude around personal data and just data use in general has resulted in an endless string of, of, of headlines um, that constantly are just things that are companies that are just violating people's privacy. And in the United States, it tends to be, well, you know, whatever, uh, people don't really care about privacy, let's just move on to the next big data breach or the next big you know, terms and conditions change that's really gonna irritate people, nothing happens. The GDPR changes that and requires you to hire somebody that maybe is gonna flag that for you. And I think that's a net positive. Great, so we have about 10 more minutes, but before, before we turn to audience questions, I'll ask one more thing to the panel. Um, how can congressional staffers best emphasize everything that you just explained? What's one takeaway? Where can they go for more information? Well, I, I, I mean, I would look at privacyshield.org. Uh, I guess that's the uh, URL. Uh, sorry, .gov, uh, pardon me, .gov. And I knew it was .gov, and I automatically assumed it was .org. I don't know what happened. But yeah, privacyshield.gov is, is a good first stop. Uh, I think... Um, uh, I would, I, I think in terms of resources, one of the best resources for me has been uh, Daphne Keller's uh, uh, treatment of these issues at Stanford uh, Law School Center for Internet and Society. Uh, just go to the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford and just read everything you can. But in terms of communicating it to your bosses, I mean, some, you know, I've had bosses like this too, just say, you know, that's in Europe, you know, I'm really focused on, you know, I'm focused on my district. <laughs> You know, and or I'm focused on my state, and 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 one of the things you have to, uh, uh, I think that you have to gently sometimes communicate to your bosses is that this is a framework that really does impose costs on your constituents. It's one that really maybe actually gives uh, uh, advantages to some to your consistent your constituents and rights that are worth thinking about. And the fact is, we are part of a, a global uh, e-commerce and a global information environment. And everybody, no matter how you know, no matter how focused you are on you know the next election or passing this or that domestic bill, you have to be aware that this is part of the uh, uh, framework that you're working in. Yeah, I would, I would, I would suggest, I mean, of course, to go to the uh, European Commission website. Uh, they have issued recently a very concrete guidance. Uh, I'm not talking about the. GDPR and its 97 articles and, <laughs> uh, and pages, but but if you go on the Commission website, you have really something uh, for citizens and for SMEs with, with concrete questions and answer concrete cases, examples. I think it's really it's really well done. Um, and also, I mean, turning to uh, turning to the what certain DPAs have, have produced is, is very interesting and, and very very clear and, and concise. So and and we are also on 22nd and K, so you are welcome to come to the EU delegation. We are not very far away, and we'll help you as much as we can. I'll just say, so CDT is fortunate enough to work with a number of members on various privacy stuff, so we're happy to serve as a resource. Um, I guess I would also say, uh, and this is something I didn't say earlier, um, in terms of the GDPR as being, having tremendous potential for job creation, um, I would direct everyone to the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Um, their membership, just to sort of show how privacy has become this thing, their membership has exploded from 15,000 in 2014 to 30,000 last fall. Um, they predict that there's going to be 30,000 data protection officers in the U.S. and Europe by the end of the decade. That's um, a conservative prediction. That's a good, in my view. And, and so, and they, and the, and I think their high range is 100,000 yeah, people. Yeah, it could be. 100, in any event, yeah. it, so they obviously have an interest in seeing privacy laws, but they've also done a tremendous amount of actual just writing on what the practical implications of the GDPR for companies and and yeah. users, um, and 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 it's an it's unvarnished in the way that I think um, some of the, the guidance that comes from regulators or from all of the many law firms, they also have all sorts of GDPR resources. Um, to get our expertise, you have to hire us. <laughs> but um, it, it is an issue that matters. I think we're sort of back to where we started because it touches on U.S. companies who don't have um, offices or employees in the EU and is imposing this, this compliance regime on them. Do we have any questions in the audience? Yes, sir. Thank you. 
uh, it is uh, it, it potentially has huge impact on First Amendment protections. Uh, I, I I can't lie about this. It actually does because uh, remember this is not you know the First Amendment as it's uh, interpreted in the United States does accommodate privacy protections and typically you know we we have a regime of privacy torts which may be uh, in the common law of U.S. jurisdictions or they may be in the statutory law of U.S. jurisdictions, but those are not comprehensive privacy protections. And keep in mind that uh, uh, the right to be forgotten is not just about private information, it's also about public information. And there are really two uh, aspects of it that I think raise uh, First Amendment issues, or for the sake of uh, our, our European uh, members of the audience and members of the panel, I will also say they also in fact uh, affect the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other EU privacy instruments, which is number one, everybody, everybody, has, a right, uh, everybody has a right to seek information and to impart information. So, so to the extent that information is ever erased, you can't seek or impart it anymore. And this is relevant not just to journalists who may actually want to go through old newspaper records and dig up uh, and dig and do background research on people who are public figures or involved in matters of public concern, but it also may involve research as well. So, for example, you have a huge academic, you know, we have a huge academic interest in looking at how people, for example, use the Internet or engage in e-commerce. And it also involves business as well, because typically you want to learn things about uh, 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 how users have interacted with your service. Now, it should be uh, underscored that the GDPR, uh, you know, and the regimes that we've talked about that will follow from the GDPR uh, take some of this stuff into account, but it's not clear how this will play out in, a, as a practical concern. And so if, if you're, the takeaway from this is yes, there are absolutely tensions between the free speech understanding that we have in the United States and in some other uh, common law jurisdictions and in some other uh, uh, developed countries as against uh, the privacy protections uh, under the GDPR. Uh, that said, many uh, privacy authority, many uh, 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 GDPR uh, uh, data protection lawyers will tell you, oh, we don't really see a tension or there shouldn't be that much tension. Uh, I think they're wrong, but we'll see. Great. Any other questions? Yes. The London one. Uh, the UK has like surveilled me or something. Well, well, if you've been to London, they have sur they have <laughs> definitely <laughs> surveilled you. Anyone else have anything to add to that? On on the right to be forgotten, I mean, I, I would, have, I mean, I, I think we it would be worth a full panel, uh, and certainly worth also looking at it in a, in a year or two from now. But I mean, the main point would be that it's not an absolute right. I mean, and it's also very clear in the GDPR. I mean, uh, if processing is necessary to exercise the right of freedom of expression and information, then the right of the right to leisure doesn't apply. So I think what we would love to see is how courts and how DPAs will will interpret. I mean, you have the Costera case from uh, a few a few years ago, uh, but it's I would say it's not the end of the story. I mean, there are provisions uh, when for archiving purposes, historical purposes, statistical purposes, public health interest, where the right to leisure is is limited. So I mean, I, I wouldn't see it necessarily in that's, that's in right. Conflict with the First Amendment. That's right. It's not necessarily in conflict, and I think that's correct. And in fact, if you look at the uh, at the uh, efforts in in member states to interpret the right to be forgotten, what you've seen is that some courts, notably uh, in the Netherlands, uh, but certainly in some other jurisdictions within the EU, have have struck pretty good balances with regard to the right to be forgotten. But that's not yet. You know, it's not a shared understanding uh, among all member states yet. 
What, what also is, I think, problematic about the right to be forgotten is that it puts a lot of power into the hands of Google. Uh, I, I actually think that's really what it boils down to here. Uh, this is a provision that is largely directed at Google. Um, and if anybody wants reading, they actually just put out a really fascinating, with lots of pretty graphics, and it's not super dense, um, it's, a, it's a report on three years of their experience with the right to be forgotten. It's from a set of their Google researchers where they, you know, a lot of this is done by human review and they sort of detailed the different sorts of trends they were seeing from EU member states and, and where the, the right to be forgotten requests were coming from. Um, and it's, it's interesting. And, uh, you know, the, the, the factoid I took from it is that since 2014, Google has received 2.4 million requests to have a, a URL search result erased. Um, and in the end, Google has uh, delisted 43% of these URLs. So, so, so yeah, and, and, and let me add one more thought to that in maybe a minute uh, or less. And that's that this is a burden of doing business. This is a cost that, that everybody who, who does the, who, any potential Google competitor somewhere in the future or Facebook competitor somewhere in the future will have to take into account the fact that they have to comply with this stuff. And so what you have is a regulation which for good or for ill, uh, it, you know, incumbents actually will find it a lot easier to comply and make, make fine-tuned discriminations about whether to comply or not with uh, uh, takedown orders. Uh, a startup, you know, you probably just take it down. Great. Well, this has been a remarkable discussion. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but please join me in giving a round of applause to our esteemed panelists here. And thank you to you all for attending. Have a wonderful weekend. My weekend begins now. <laughs> I'm going to begin it right now.